何Pray for the Gods is intended to be a spiritual successor to Shadow of the Colossus, which is ambitious to say the least. Shadow of the Colossus is one of the most universally praised games to ever be created, and still to this day remains one of the most creative and groundbreaking games in the history of the medium, both in terms of actual gameplay and how it told its story. Giant boss fights in video games were nothing new in 2005, but the idea of an in-game character model being a dynamic part of the environment that you could actually interact with to the point of being able to freely climb around on it was something totally out of left field, and it was complemented with an expansive, beautiful, and mysterious game world that not only pushed the PS2 to its absolute limit, but was so fucking captivating to the audience that it started a borderline online religion. Shadow of the Colossus is a masterpiece by any definition of the term, and almost any criticism of it either doesn't hold up or is so minor it isn't really important enough to matter. And before anyone in the comments says that horse controls are bad, they are not bad. You just want the horse to control like a fucking Mario Kart instead of a horse. The point here is that even if your goal is to make Shadow of the Colossus but a little bit worse, you have gigantic balls and a project in front of you that has so much baggage and built-in hype before development even starts, it's difficult to imagine delivering anything that is up to par. However, against all odds, No Matter Studios have indeed managed to deliver something. Is it as good as Shadow of the Colossus? No. Shadow of the Colossus is something you sort of definitionally can't do a second time. It's like trying to do the Beatles again. You can only do something revolutionary and genre-defining one time before everything after that is just sort of derivative work. And of course, because this is the internet, I need to clarify that derivative doesn't mean something is bad. Derivative work is fine, sometimes it's even really good but it just doesn't hit the same as the original in most cases. It took Nintendo, one of the best, most financially successful, and undeniably the most experienced developers in the entire industry, 20 years to finally get one up on their most beloved game. Unfortunately, I don't have time to defend this statement, so while the Zelda nerds are seething in the comments, let's move on to the actual point of this video, which is taking a look at Pray for the Gods. One thing you might notice immediately if you're a big-brained smart man is that down here in the corner you can see that I am technically playing an early access build of the game. Do not be fooled. I will be releasing this video on the day the game's 1.0 release launches, and I am very confident that this review is going to be a fair review of the final product. The main differences between the version I played and the full release are, first and foremost, the 1.0 version of Pray for the Gods includes the last two bosses, and secondly, it includes a handful of quality of life changes and minor content additions that do nothing but improve the experience. This means that the build of the game that I played through is more or less feature complete, and the full experience is there. Just like with my Monster Sanctuary video, the game is 90% done and we are just waiting for one last patch to give us the last 10% of the game, which is more than enough to get a complete picture of the game's pros and cons. Disclaimers aside, Pray for the Gods can kind of be divided into two segments. It's open world survival segments, and it's big Colossus style boss fights. Let's get into the boss fights first, since that one is easy to get into and is probably what most of you are the most interested in hearing about. Bosses in Pray for the Gods function identically to the bosses in Shadow of the Colossus. Each one is a large thing that needs to be climbed on to poke its weak points, and each one represents a puzzle that needs to be solved. This isn't like a Souls game where we can just run in and start swinging a greatsword around. We need to figure out some kind of trick or plan that gives us access to the boss's weak points. The gameplay aspect of Shadow of the Colossus has been very faithfully recreated here, but more importantly, I think No Matter has absolutely nailed the feeling of scale and tension you get when climbing around on one of these things. 
Shadow of the Colossus has a difficult to pinpoint tone when you're on a Colossus. That comes from the gameplay of constantly managing your stamina and looking for the next weak point, and from the sense of scale given to you by the incredible level design complemented by the iconic soundtrack and the sound design and heavy animations of the Colossus. This formula is something that seems like it would be easy to just sort of replicate, but nothing this abstract is ever that easy to dissect and define and then reproduce. It is very impressive that bosses in Pray for the Gods just legitimately feel like bosses in Shadow of the Colossus from the ground up, and I was highly impressed with their quality. That really is all there is to say here. They are just good. Maybe I could complain about a slight lack of polish, but it doesn't really seem like it's enough to justify a mention. Something new that Pray for the Gods introduces in the boss department is this champion mini-boss that is essentially a smaller boss fight with only one weak point. I'll talk more about this one later, but for now just remember that it exists. The second half of the game, like I already mentioned, are its open world survival mechanics, which are a lot more complicated and I imagine are going to be a lot more controversial and divisive than the incredibly well designed boss fights. First, we are going to have to address the fact that the open world section of this game is very, very heavily inspired by Breath of the Wild, to the point where inspired might be a generous term. And since the phrase, this looks like Breath of the Wild, is a completely insufferable meme in the gaming community, I now have to prove that I know what I'm talking about by showing you examples. We have gliding. We have durability on every item except armor. We have trees that fall down into physics engine logs that we can chop up for wood. We have survival mechanics like hunger and body temperature that need to be managed. We can climb on most things. There are Korok-style puzzles all over the game world that will reward you with these totems. If you get three totems, you can choose between a stamina or a health upgrade. And finally, there are a giant pile of crafting resources you can use to craft and upgrade your items. Also, they made this joke about the Breath of the Wild cooking system as a nod. Essentially, what No Matter has done here is taken Shadow of the Colossus and Breath of the Wild and made them kiss which isn't exactly the worst strategy for making a game. Lots of good games get made by slamming existing genres together, like this one for example. Survival mechanics are something that are a big sticking point for a lot of people. Some people love them, some people hate them. Personally, I tend to enjoy the extra immersion you get from adding them, and it's one of the reasons I loved Outward. Luckily, the Pray for the Gods devs are aware of how annoying some people think they are, and there are a ton of difficulty options that will make the survival mechanics more or less important. For my playthrough though, I wanted to make sure I was taking a fair look at them, so I played with the survival mechanics fully engaged. So what kind of meter management are we dealing with here? Well, we have body temperature, which of course will start to damage you if it gets too low, and can kill you. Then we have hunger and sleep meters, which won't kill you, but if they are low enough, your stamina will regenerate much slower, which is obviously a problem when you're trying to climb around on a giant yeti to attack its weak point for massive damage. Especially if you're an absolute mark who got scammed by upgrading your health instead of the obviously superior stamina. You can stand next to a fire to bring up your body temperature, and obviously you can sleep and eat to bring up the other two meters. Nothing too wild going on here. At first, none of these, even on the harder difficulty, really seem to matter that much. Just like in Shadow of the Colossus, every time you finish a boss fight, you get sent back to a central temple. But the first several bosses in the game are so close to you, you can kind of just rush over to them and finish them before your meters get too low. Maybe you have to stop and kill a couple rabbits for meat, but other than that, no big deal. However, later on, when the bosses are farther and farther away from you and the encounters themselves start to get longer and more difficult, the survival mechanics become a lot more important. You need to stay warm on the journey over to the farther corners of the map, 
and you need to make sure that your hunger and sleep meters are full by the time you get where you're going so you actually have the stamina to finish the fight. These survival mechanics actually integrate pretty well with the boss segments. The problem is a lot of the other mechanics in the open world survival parts don't integrate very well at all, and it kind of creates this weird feeling of playing two different games at once. What do I mean by this? Well, let's look at the other two major components of the open world, the combat and the exploration puzzles. The puzzles are kind of the logical starting point here because they will loop back around into combat in a way that will become obvious here in a second. First of all, one of the key components of puzzles are the totems, which actually work very well with the boss fight sections because they can increase your health and stamina, which directly benefit you during these fights in a very obviously observable way. Things get a little bit more weird when you start looking at puzzle caves, though. Pray for the Gods has a giant map, and within this giant map there are many caves, and within a certain portion of these caves you can solve puzzles that will give you items, usually armor, sometimes a weapon. The strange issue here is that these items don't really feel like they loop back into cooperating with the boss fight segments of the game in any real way. Yes, the armor has stats, and sometimes they are even better stats than the stats you already had, but I really didn't feel like my choice between armor mattered that much. How much does a couple armor points really matter when you're getting punched by a 40 foot tall yeti? Maybe the cold resistance matters, but building a fire is so easy, I'm not sure, and cold resistance isn't something that depletes fast enough during a boss fight to realistically kill you. And you have so much stamina and so many opportunities to get more stamina that I'm not sure item weight's that important either. Then the weapons make even less sense. First, you don't even use weapons for boss fights. You attack them by activating these weird rune seals. But you can use weapons against the random enemies you fight out in the wasteland, which are mostly bad. You'll notice that I'm not using a lock-on function, because there isn't one. In the full release of the game, there is not only a lock-on, but also the dodge roll has been tweaked to make this combat feel better, so these encounters will feel a lot more fluid, but that still doesn't stop them from not really feeling very important. The obvious reward for killing things like these Draugr type guys is they drop crafting resources. You can use the resources to craft and repair things, but you get so many resources from other sources in the game that it doesn't really seem like that great of a reward to justify dealing with the combat, especially since the armor and the weapons that you'll be upgrading don't really feel that important for anything other than more questionable combat. This means that even when the experience is improved by being able to lock on, I'm not sure what motivation the player has to engage with this combat system other than they just kind of feel like it. This is then, of course, amplified even more by the fact that this game uses survival mechanics, which kind of incentivize the player to be smart about not wasting time and resources. So, just skip the fights. All of this sort of creates this weird vacuum where it feels like the puzzle caves you complete to get new items and the combat with the skeleton boys feels like a separate, unfinished game that doesn't really have that much to do with the Shadow of the Colossus game that's going on next door. This does have some subjective elements to it. If you're the kind of person that likes to 100% complete games, or just likes exploration, or maybe you want to relax in a winter hellscape and search for treasure in caves or something, you'll have fun with this part of the game. It isn't that poorly designed. But from my perspective, which usually focuses on the bigger picture of a game's design, I don't really know what's going on here. Remember when I said Pray for the Gods basically took Breath of the Wild and Shadow of the Colossus and made them kiss? Sometimes it feels like what's really going on here is that Shadow of the Colossus invited Breath of the Wild over to hang out, and they had a couple of beers, and Shadow of the Colossus was like, Hey, I heard there was a pretty good documentary that just came out on Netflix. Then they both go up into Shadow of the Colossus's room, and, like, 20 minutes into the documentary, they both start to kiss, but 
Shadow of the Colossus isn't really into it, and he can't get hard, and he's like, I'm sorry, I think I just drank too much, but he definitely didn't drink too much and is lying because he doesn't want to be rude, and then they have awkward sex anyway and never talk to each other again. I hope this analogy made sense. The combat problems are especially odd to me because the champion mini-boss fights that I mentioned earlier are so fucking good. I'm not sure why No Matter didn't just add a few more of these to the game instead of doing the skeletons and the spooky ghosts. Weapons actually matter against this guy, and if there were more enemies like him, then I would be heavily interested in getting better weapons from the caves. It seems like maybe in their quest to replicate Breath of the Wild mechanics, No Matter might have accidentally tacked on a combat system they didn't really need. All of this might seem harsh, but in the end, even though Pray for the Gods ends up kind of being two separate games at the same time, I would imagine the bosses are so well done, it goes a long way to allowing me to forgive these faults. And I think once the quality of life changes that are going to be introduced in the 1.0 release are live, a lot of the small, annoying problems that made combat and exploration frustrating will be fixed. I mean, if we're being honest here, the big masterpiece itself has a ton of items that were more or less useless, and a bunch of weird item upgrades that weren't really necessary, and yet, we all did those fucking time trials anyway. So, the gameplay loops kind of disagree with each other sometimes, but I don't know if this is enough to say the experience is bad. A lot of the complementary aspects to gameplay, like level design and that kind of thing, are very well done. My only real complaint with the game world is that it does feel a lot smaller than Shadow of the Colossus, which kind of hurts the game's overall sense of scale, but at the same time, Pray for the Gods is a game that is significantly more detailed. So here we're kind of dealing with a trade-off. Pray for the Gods is a smaller game all around, but it's a lot more dense. Personally, I love winter theming in video games, so I think that was fun for me. Maybe I'll do a video on the long dark someday or something. Also, there is a grappling hook. I forgot to mention that. Most of the bosses have grapple hook points on them also. I wish I had more footage of me doing grappling hook things, but I guess I just wasn't in it for the grapple hook playstyle. As far as the game's story goes, there isn't really that much to talk about. Pray for the Gods takes place in a vaguely Nordic setting and is inspired by a lot of Nordic mythology. We've got the Jormungandr, and there are a lot of runes, and the game takes place during a period of endless winter, which is probably referencing the Great Winter that precedes Ragnarok. I'm pretty sure this wolf is Fenris. We all know how this shit works by now. Basically, what's going on here is winter won't stop, and we need to turn the gods off and turn them back on again. You're playing as Norse tech support. I'll put it this way. The finale to the story won't be released until the 1.0 version comes out, but I'm not exactly on the edge of my seat waiting for its conclusion, and I probably could already predict what the end is going to be. Alright, let's get into conclusions here. Is Pray for the Gods a good game? Yeah, it's pretty good. The game itself is split into two halves that sometimes have trouble communicating with each other, but the actual boss fights, which are the game's major selling point, are phenomenally well designed, and perfectly in line with what you would expect. There are less of them, only eight in the full release, but it's clear that this game's entire mission was to be a smaller but far more detailed attempt at what Shadow of the Colossus did, and I have a pretty good feeling based on the game's fair degree of financial success that there is a strong chance additional bosses and content will be added in future patches or DLC. The open world survival components definitely have flaws, but there is something here if your personal taste in games is geared towards exploration or getting that sweet sweet 100% run. I don't think we're looking at a masterpiece here, but we're definitely looking at an ambitious project that is probably worth the price tag if you really want to get some additional big hairy boss fights into your life. I guess if you're still a little bit skeptical, Maybe wait until it goes on sale or something, but 
I definitely didn't regret playing this despite its flaws. It should also be noted that this is No Matter Studios' debut game, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, they're industry veterans, but there's only three of them, so at this point, even if the game was bad, which it definitely is not, just getting it out of early access would have been a fucking miracle, and they definitely deserve the recognition for getting a competent project out the door. If you want to see more videos like this one, consider subscribing. A like and a comment also really help out. If you're already subscribed, hit the bell, and of course, down in the description, I have a link to my active Discord community, which is always up to some kind of a shenanigan. I also have a link to my Twitch channel, where I stream from time to time, so make sure you follow me on Twitch. And finally, follow me on Twitter, so you don't miss any important updates. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.